would it burst your own foolish heart to look at an account of 5,000 pounds in a solid bank? Can't help it, Father. I'd sooner have that horse happy than go to heaven. And kissed you? About a dozen times. Phew. And, and he held me so tight and kept saying he loved me. And all the time he went right on kissing me. Did you kiss him back? Well, well at first I did, but... Well, after a while, I, I wanted to stop. Well, Liz, uh, I'm quoting you now. You once said uh, you had the mind of a child in a woman's body. Am I right? That was when I was 15, yes. Sir. Oh, I see. Well, I was wondering, since you've been married to such a mat mature man of the world as Mr. Todd, you feel you've matured somewhat now? Well, I hope so. Otherwise, I'd be slightly retarded, wouldn't I? Because <laughs> I'm sick of opening that door every other day and finding you boozed up, burned out, and ugly. Why do you come here like this? Where have I always come, Steve? At least I can be honest with you. Remember, remember. I want you to forget me, please. Forget? How? Oh, I can never be more far away from you than this. Nikos Cassidyne had a deep and ab abiding love. I said, Cassidyne. That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, sh <laughs> right. That's a cop. I see a title myself. I'm sorry, folks. I'm not used to acting. <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor, an unauthorized biography. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Download Veeley now. For more than 50 years, Elizabeth Taylor's dazzling beauty and scandalous life has captured our fascination, provoked our envy, teased our curiosity, and at times aroused our pity. She is American royalty and the undisputed queen of the tabloids. As a teenage movie star, she was the very embodiment of youthful innocence. And it was that indelible image so carefully nurtured by Hollywood that entrapped her. A prisoner of fame and celebrity living in a twilight world more fantasy than reality. She became the world's most famous wayward daughter, growing older but never really growing up. Taylor herself once said, my troubles all started because I had the body of a woman and the emotions of a child. Elizabeth Rosemont Taylor was born on February 27, 1932 in Heathwood House on Wildwood Road an upper-class suburb of London. She was the second child of Frances and Sarah Taylor, who were Americans living in Europe. Elizabeth's mother had been an actress and enjoyed some success, even playing Broadway. But she gave up her career in 1929 when Elizabeth's older brother Howard was born. Taylor's early years were spent in a storybook setting of elegant country homes, horseback riding, English private schools, and dance lessons. Although outwardly shy, she recalled later, like my mother, I always wanted to be an actress. In 1939, Europe stood on the brink of war, and Francis Taylor sent his family back to America. On the boat trip to the United States, Elizabeth saw her first movie. It was Shirley Temple in The Little Princess. Later, her father joined the family in California and ran an art gallery in Beverly Hills. Elizabeth, now seven, was enrolled in the exclusive Willard Elementary School. By 1939, the country was eagerly following the progress of David O. Selznick's film, Gone with the Wind. After a well-publicized search, British actress Vivian Lee won the coveted role of Scarlett O'Hara, and from the moment Lee was chosen, people began to remark to Elizabeth's mother what a remarkable resemblance her beautiful young daughter had to Vivian Lee. Sarah Taylor was urged to have her daughter screen tested for the role of Bonnie Blue, Scarlett's child in the film. Although very tempted, Taylor's mother believed the family would soon be returning to England and passed up the opportunity. The outbreak of World War II smashed all hopes of the Taylor's early return to England. Young Elizabeth's astonishing beauty could not be denied, and Hollywood's seductive lure proved stronger than any objections her father may have had about his child going into the movies. On April 21st, 1941, a nine-year-old Elizabeth Taylor signed a seven-year contract with Universal Studios. The terms of the contract were $100 a week for a minimum of 20 weeks for the first year, and by 1948, 
At the end of the contract, she would be guaranteed $2,000 per week with a minimum 40 weeks. Her first film was the 1942 release, There's One Born Every Minute, originally titled Man or Mouse. In the film, Taylor was paired with our gang veteran Carl Alfalfa Schweitzer. All Taylor could remember was, I had to run around a lot and shoot rubber bands at ladies' bottoms. The film was a bomb. Fortunately, Elizabeth's part was so small, she was not even reviewed. Whether it was her performance or just the poor showing of the movie, Taylor's seven-year contract with Universal was terminated barely one year after she had signed it. But fate and Elizabeth's English upbringing would take a hand in her career. Over at MGM, filming had begun on Lassie Come Home. Maria Flynn had been cast to play the daughter of the Duke of Rudling, who buys Lassie from a poor family, taking it away from its beloved friend Joe, played by Roddy McDowell. But the actress has suddenly grown too tall to play opposite McDowell. Taylor made a perfect replacement. She sounded British, and she could actually ride a horse. Whether or not she could act was less important. After all, Lassie was the real star of the film. But critics did notice Taylor. Variety said, she's a pretty moppet who shows up to good advantage. Taylor's appearance in Lassie Come Home began a 17-year association with MGM and a lifelong friendship with Roddy McDowell. In 1944, Taylor was loaned out to 20th Century Fox, where she had a minor part in Jane Eyre. Back at MGM, she was reunited with Roddy McDowell in another Hollywood British film, The White Cliffs of Dover. Taylor and McDowell were the only kids on the MGM lot who could effectively pass as British. Taylor's English background had become an asset, giving her an edge over other actresses, and her Englishness was used to advantage whenever possible. In 1945, MGM had acquired the screen rights to the English novel National Velvet. But in nine years, they had not found the right actress to play Velvet Brown. 1944, Sarah Taylor approached producer Pandro Berman about Elizabeth playing the role. After all, she did have an English accent, and she could write. The only problem seemed to be that young Elizabeth was too short and slender for the part. Undaunted, Taylor went on a three-month weight gaining program. Luckily, she also experienced growth spurts as well. In just 12 weeks, she had grown over three inches. Metro-Golden-Mayer now presents this most human story of a boy, a girl, and a horse in all the warm tenderness of its modest, unpretentious sincerity. National Velvet, an intriguing title. The Velvet is for Velvet Brown, shy and unassuming. Her only dream in life is horses, particularly after she wins an unruly, mischief-loving sorrel in a raffle. As to the national part of the title, with wholesome faith in her horse, the pie, Velvet and the boy train him for the grand national steeplechase, the greatest, grandest prize a horse ever won. As to the boy, he is courageous, stout of heart. The horse not good enough? The pie? That's not only the pie, ma'am, nor the money, it's a score of other things. 30 jumps, the hardest course in the world. The national, the greatest race on earth. Training him month on month. Then there's Velvet's young brother. I was sick all night. And her loving, understanding mother. Things come suitable to the time, Velvet. Enjoy each thing, then forget it and go on to the next. There's a time for everything. There's a time for having a horse in the Grand National, for being in love, having children. Velvet's father isn't a frivolous man, but I'd like to risk a couple of pounds. Put it on the pie for me. Yes. And I'll not be angry if you don't tell the missus about it. Would it burst your own foolish heart to look at an account of 5,000 pounds in a solid bank? Can't help it, Father. I'd sooner have that horse happy than go to heaven. National Velvet became one of the top pictures of 1944 and changed Taylor's life forever. To get the part, she signed a long-term contract with MGM and, in her words, made her the studio's chattel for the next 18 years. But the film also put a star on Elizabeth's dressing room door. To this day, Taylor speaks lovingly about the film. Taylor, I was wondering uh, if you really, really enjoy um, filming National Velvet. I really, really did. I, I love doing it. And they gave me the horse, so that made it all the better. 
1946, Elizabeth Taylor received her first top billing in The Courage of Lassie. However, billing for the beloved Lassie posed another problem. Actually, the dog's name in the film is Bill. It was only after shooting was completed that the studio changed the film's title three times, from Hold the Torch High to Blue Sierra to finally The Courage of Lassie. In fact, the name Lassie is never heard in the movie. All the name changes only reinforced in Taylor's mind how precarious and uncertain life could be at the dream factory called MGM. It was in this sylvan setting that Kathy first saw Bill. And with the passing days, the bonds of affection between them grew stronger. You see, a man goes to church to talk to a god that he can't see. But a dog, he can see his god, your Bill's god. And all he wants is to love you and have you tell him what you want him to do. It's a very odd feeling. Oh How difficult life at the studios could be was demonstrated when Elizabeth and her mother spoke with MGM mogul Louis Mayer about music lessons for Elizabeth. Mayer shouted at 14-year-old Elizabeth and her mother, Don't tell me how to run my business. You're both gutter snipes. Reportedly, Elizabeth shot back, You and your studio can both go to hell. Taylor has said from that time on, she never saw or spoke to Mayer again. But the behind-the-scenes acrimony didn't stop the publicity department from doing its job. And in July of 1947, a stunning 15-year-old Elizabeth Taylor graced the cover of Life magazine. This young lady looks about the same age you were when I came out to Pleasantville to rescue you. Rescue me? Mm. You came out there to talk me into marrying you. Uh, it worked out just the same. Uh. MGM loaned out Taylor to Warner Brothers for the 1947 release, Life with Father, based on the long-running Broadway play. Taylor received $3,500 a week, which was five times her MGM salary. Taylor was billed third behind William Powell and Irene Dunn. Now 16, Taylor would begin to play roles with sexuality, with only puppy love, as in Life with Father. It was during filming that the first signs of trouble that plagued Taylor throughout her life first appeared. Five shooting days were lost due to health difficulties. Adding to the problems, Elizabeth's mother, Sarah, was rumored to have begun an affair with the film's director, Michael Cortese, which resulted in a temporary separation between Elizabeth's parents. You write me as soon as you get there. Maybe I'll be too busy. Maybe I won't have time. Well, you find the time. Let's not have any nonsense about that. You'll write me first, and you'll do it right away the first day. How do you know I'll take orders from you? I'll show you. Give me your hand. Why should I? Give me your hand, confound it. What do you want with my hand? I just wanted it. What are you thinking about? I was just thinking. About what? I was hoping you'd write me first, because that would mean you liked me. Well, what's my writing first got to do with liking you? You do like me, then? Of course I do. I like you better than any girl I ever met. But you don't like me well enough to write first. Well, I don't see how one thing's got anything to do with the other. But a girl can't write first because... because she's a girl. Well, that's nonsense. If a girl has something to write about and a fellow hasn't, there's no reason why she shouldn't write first. You know, the first few days I was here, you do anything for me. And then you changed. There used to be a lot of fun. Then all of a sudden, you turned into an old sober size. Why, why, you even dress like an old sober size. What's the matter? I just happened to remember something. What? Oh, I know. It's because this is the last time we'll be together. Mary, please. But Clarence, we'll see each other in a month when I come back. Oh, Clarence, please write me first, because that'll show me how much you like me. Please. I'll show you how much I like you. Get up, get up. Oh, oh. oh Mary, don't do that. Please don't do that. Oh, no, you're just a bold and forward girl. Oh, no, no, 
it's not that. Oh, is it because it's Sunday? No, it would be the same any day. Oh, you just didn't want me sitting on your lap. Oh, it was nice of you to do it. It was nice of you, so you told me to get up. You just couldn't bear to have me sit there. Oh, well, you needn't write me first. You needn't write me any letters at all. Because I'll stay in the room without opening them. I never want to see you again. Oh, Mary, Mary, listen to me. Mary, please. Oh, Mary. <laughs> Elizabeth was back at Metro for the 1948 release, A Date with Judy, which was a rare musical excursion for Taylor. The film was coolly received by the critics, but they did notice that Miss Taylor had certainly grown up. The Herald Tribune said, Taylor had been touched by MGM's magic wand and turned into a real 14-carat, 100-proof siren with a whole new career. Eddie Lamar had better watch out. Miss Taylor's coming along. Haven't you forgotten something? Maybe. I'm spoiled and egotistical. That's right. Maybe I'll get used to you, say, and we'll say in a few years. If you don't, it'll be all your fault. We're strictly on the corny side, corny side, corny side. We're strictly on the corny side, and the folks like us that way. Nineteen forty eight brought the release of Julia Misbehaves and the beginnings of Elizabeth Misbehaves as well. Reportedly, she fell in love with her co star, Peter Lawford, who was ten years older than the sixteen year old Taylor. The studio was so concerned they assigned young star Marshall Thompson to be Elizabeth's first official boyfriend. Taylor rebelled, saying, Nobody was going to tell me who to date and what to wear. Have I heard what they're saying about Julia? I certainly have. I've heard every word of it. And it's all true. Julia's scandalous. She's shocking. But she's such fun that I asked Metro Goldwyn Mayer if I might play her part on the screen so that we could bring you, our friends in the audience, a really gay, carefree picture. The picture's called Julia Misbehaves. Julia Misbehaves is one of those rare entertainments that combine excitement and fun with a grand love story. Rather, two love stories. Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon are one affair, and a very explosive one. Handsome Peter Lawford and that exquisitely beautiful Elizabeth Taylor have their own romance. Oh, Richie! Oh! And it has its big moments. He kissed you? About a dozen times. Phew. And he held me so tight and kept saying he loved me. And all the time he went right on kissing me. Did you kiss him back? Well, well at first I did, but... Well, after a while, I, I wanted to stop. In the summer of 1948, Taylor announced she intended to be engaged to Glenn Taylor, an army lieutenant and football star. Later, she confessed it was a childish romance, but it made Taylor a steady diet for all the Hollywood gossips. And for the next 45 years, she would never let them down. In 1949, MGM released Little Women, which was the third film version of the classic story. Although not as well received as the 1933 David O. Selznick version, it proved to be financially successful for the studio. But four of the loveliest little women it has ever been my happy privilege to meet. Margaret O'Brien, June Allison. I'm Hugo. Uh -huh. Elizabeth Taylor and Janet Leigh. You're going to have a lovely nose someday, Amy. Yeah, I know. Now you see, Meg, I'm a writer. 
And I write about girls who are in love. So I know. You have none of the symptoms. You, you eat all right, you sleep like a log, you're not twittery or cross, and you don't mope in corners. Therefore, you're not in love. In the fall of 1948, Taylor traveled to London to begin filming The Conspirator, an anti-communist Cold War drama. It was billed as Taylor's first adult love story. It proved to be a disaster. The Harvard Lampoon named Taylor the year's most objectionable ingenue. Back in Hollywood, Taylor met and became engaged to William Pauley, a worldly and wealthy businessman. The engagement lasted through the filming of The Big Hangover, but when Taylor announced she would begin shooting her next film, Father of the Bride, a disappointed Pauley announced to the papers, although I love her very much, all her energy goes into her constant work. Consequently, he released Taylor from their engagement. In August of 1949, Elizabeth Taylor appeared on the cover of Time magazine. In October of 1949, Taylor was loaned out to Paramount for A Place in the Sun, based on the 1925 novel, An American Tragedy. Director George Stevens paired Taylor with actor Montgomery Cliff. Taylor quickly developed a crush on the handsome young actor, who also shared her distress of the studio system. Taylor was not aware that Cliff was struggling with his bisexuality. As Taylor came to grips with Cliff's true nature, their relationship became very strong, although sexless. But Paramount's press department didn't want to miss out on a good thing and started pairing the two at public events, like the premiere of Cliff's film, The Heiress. The on-screen chemistry between the couple was electric. Cliff's intensity drove Taylor to new acting heights. When A Place in the Sun was released in 1951, critics acclaimed Taylor's work as the best of her career and worthy of an Academy Award. On January 26, 1950, Elizabeth Taylor, now a veteran of 13 films, engaged twice, and the center of many romantic speculations, graduated from high school. One month later, she announced her engagement to Nicholas Hilton, son of the chairman of the hotel chain. And on May 6, the couple was married in Beverly Hills. The 1950 release, Father of the Bride, had echoes of real life. Spencer Tracy's portrayal of a father suffering through the wedding arrangements for his headstrong daughter, played by Taylor, had unmistakable similarities to Taylor's relationship with studio boss Louis Mayer, or any other man for that matter. I always used to think that marriages were simple affairs. Boy meets girl, fall in love, they get married, have babies. Eventually the babies grow up and meet other babies. And they fall in love get married and have baby and so on and on. When Taylor returned to Hollywood to film the sequel to Father of the Bride, Father's Little Dividend, rumors were rampant her marriage to Hilton was in trouble. By December of 1950, the Hiltons would be separated. In January of 1951, Taylor was hospitalized for an infection and was reported to be near nervous collapse. Later that month, Taylor and Hilton were divorced. Elizabeth's marriage had coincided with the release of Father of the Bride. And sadly, less than a year later, the sequel would be released just in time for her divorce was not quite the little dividend the studio was counting on. Oh, thanks. Huh? Uh, we're going to run along, kitten. Please come in, Pop. Quiet. I'll take the thing. Oh, Pop, was, I was horrible. I was terrible. They'll never forgive me. No, no, no. We, we, we deserve much worse than that. It wasn't you. 
You never interfere, but, but the others. Mother and Father Dunstan and, and Mom's. I'm doing too much. I'm doing too little. She wants a girl. They want a boy. No matter what the baby is, somebody's going to be disappointed. Yeah, I think you, what you'll have to do is have, uh, you know, twins, one of each sex. Thank heavens for you, Pop. You're the only one with any sense. Oh, no, no. I'm just as bad as the rest of them. But I'll tell you this. There's going to be no more of it. It'll never happen again. We'll never gang up on you again, believe me. Oh, thanks, Pop. Well, you relax, kid. Now, from now on, it's going to be your way. And, and y you won't let them make a fuss with Dr. Nordell, will you? What do you mean, dear? Well, the Donson said they were going down to have a talk with him. Oh, Pops, you won't let them do that, will oh, you? Oh, of course I won't. What nonsense. He's your doctor. You have confidence in him, faith in him. No one has a right to destroy that confidence. Thanks, Pops. It, it isn't their fault, really. It's just that, well, I, I guess they just don't understand the new way of looking at things. Well, after all, as, as Dr. Nordell says, birth is a perfectly natural thing, a, a, a glorious thing. And want you to be conscious every minute so, so they don't miss a second of it. So he believes that a woman it. should be aware of the wonderful thing that's happening to her. And another thing, he doesn't believe that a woman should be separated from her baby for one second after it's born. You, you should carry it with you right, right back to your room and, and, and keep it there uh, with you. Uh, that, Sleeping right there with you in, in your hospital room. That is a little new, isn't it? Oh, that's Pops, that's not new. Primitive woman has always done it. Dr. Nordell was in the Pacific, and he said the women there, why, why they were never separated from their babies. They, they kept them slung on their backs for the first two years of their lives. And he said it was wonderful for the babies. He said if he had his way, all of his mothers would do that. You'd, you'd carry them on your back while you were doing your housework, and then when it got hungry, you'd, you'd swing it around and, and feed it, and then swing it back again. He says it gives the baby a wonderful swing feeling it. of security. <clears throat> Uh, darling, you're, you're, you know, you're sure that this doctor, I oh, mean... Oh, Pops, it... you're not going to start that, too. Oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 no. Dr. Nordell is wonderful. Yeah. He, he's marvelous. He's, yeah. well, he's simply terribly wonderful. Oh, I'm, darling, I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. Kitten. Oh, thank you, Pops. I'm sure. Now, you, you just go to sleep and relax. Okay. Yeah. Good, Good night, night, Pops. Good night, darling. Good night. In June of 1951, Taylor traveled to London to shoot Ivanhoe. Soon after her arrival, she began dating Michael Wilding, a successful British actor she had met briefly while filming The Conspirator in 1948. Wilding was 40, Taylor was 20. They were married in London on February 21, 1952. Wilding returned to Hollywood with Taylor. On January 6, 1953, Taylor gave birth to Michael Wilding Jr., the first of two children the couple would have together. Back on the lot, Taylor negotiated a new five-year production deal with MGM at $5,000 per week, with husband Wilding also getting $3,000 a week for three years. To all the world, Taylor looked like the very embodiment of the titles of her next two films, Love is Better Than Ever and The Girl Who Had Everything. In March of 1953, Taylor was again loaned out to Paramount to replace Vivian Lee, who had suffered a nervous breakdown while filming Elephant Walk in Salon. After the principal photography had been shot, Taylor posed with co-star Peter Finch for production stills. A wind machine used in the photo session broke, shooting a metal scrap directly into Taylor's eye socket. Only quick medical surgery prevented Taylor from losing the sight in her eye. Elizabeth Taylor as the beautiful young girl who recklessly loved a man she hardly knew. The dark depths within him a mystery she had still to discover. <laughs> Here in his vast empire, carved from the exotic and dangerous jungles of Ceylon, she was to find a splendor she never dreamed of, brought like a queen to share the incredible luxury of his palace in the jungle, a palace where the night was shattered by the terrifying defiance of the great elephant herds. Nothing to worry about. But the servants, they ran away. You'll get used to that. They think that elephants are people. The elephant people, they call them. But there was a jungle of human emotion within these walls. The husband, who was like a stranger. I didn't enjoy being embarrassed in front of my friends. The stranger who stormed her defenses with irresistible force. Now you know why I came back. 
the native girl, Raina, dancing her defiance of the white woman who didn't belong with the men of Elephant Walk. Theirs is a drama mounting to an unforgettable climax, swept along by the violence of men and the fury of the giants of the jungle, breaking loose in a savage orgy of destruction. In 1954, Taylor appeared in The Last Time I Saw Paris. Many years later, in a New York Times interview, Taylor would say, The last time I saw Paris first convinced me I wanted to be an actress instead of yawning my way through parts. Her motivation for the quote may have been a result of her personal life at the time. There was increased competition for good roles as MGM's film output dropped due to television's impact on box office receipts. Also adding to Taylor's concern was her husband Michael Wilding's less than serious attitude towards his film career. So for Taylor, perfecting her acting skill was necessary for financial survival. Charlie something or other, he uh, says he's a bartender. Oh, yes. Charlie what? Uh, the Wills. I wish I were a bartender, a nice civilian bartender. Would you offer you a bit of champagne? Oh, merci. Pour les bons, vous prêtez votre verre. Bien sûr. C'est à bien, mesdames. Si, vous ne restez pas trop long d'accent. I told him we knew each other. Well, we do in a way. We were only kissing in our review. We were? Let's see now. You were one of the ones at the Ritz bar. <laughs> Et toi? <laughs> Place Vendôme. No. I know. Near the Dingo Cafe. You do remember. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's the only other place I ran into more uniforms today. <laughs> You hate me for not holding your hand while you have your baby. If you held my hand, the next thing I'd hold yours, and the next thing I'd kiss you, and the next thing... What's the matter, darling? Have you had dinner? Do you want me to fix something? Go away, Helen. Let me alone. Is it something I've done? Please, Charlie, whatever it is. All right. You're a good wife, you're devoted and loyal. You've done your duty. Now, please go back to your party and let me alone. I'm only trying to help. Help what? You, me, us. I don't know. Help what, this? Can you help another rejection? Can anybody help that? Why? Because some publisher turned you down again. Yes, again. Again, Helen, again. Can you help it that I'm stupid enough to spend five years writing three stupid books? Can you help it that I'm no writer? 
He's outside. He can't see her. I won't let him. Where are you? For the 1956 release, Giant, Taylor was reunited with A Place in the Sun's director, George Stevens. A story of wealthy Texas cattle barons, it was a real test of Taylor's new attitude toward acting. Director George Stevens said, In Giant, we gave her a difficult part. She played five different ages, including a grandmother. Beauty of her kind is hard to overcome. We put a real burden on her shoulders. In George Stevens' production of Edna Ferber's classic of the Texas Empire. Giant. Brock Hudson, born to tower over a million acres. That sure is a beautiful animal. Beautiful. Your money's no good here. Come on, let's go. You too. Hold on a minute. He never stood so tall as when he crawled. Elizabeth Taylor, the gently bred bride who became a lady. <laughs> Texas style. And James Dean. I guess you're about the best looking gal we've seen around here in a long time. The star who became a legend, who spoke for all the restless young as no one has before or since. Why, thank you, Jen. That's a very nice compliment. And I'm going to tell my husband I've met with your approval. Oh, well, no. Uh... I wouldn't do that. I mean, well, no, I... As Jet Rink, the eternal outsider of Giant. My, you sure do look pretty, Miss Leslie. You always did look pretty. Just pretty now, good enough to eat. 
And all the people, sweet and strong, bad, beautiful, but busting with Texas life. Dick, you should have shot that fellow a long time ago. Now he's too rich to kill. Although Giant became a huge hit and Taylor's work was praised by critics, her personal life was in turmoil. Michael Wilding had returned to Europe to try and revive his flagging career and help relieve the couple's marital tension. Well, the trip quickly turned into a formal separation. Taylor turned to Giant co-star Rock Hudson for comfort. Their relationship was strictly platonic as Hudson was gay, but their friendship would last a lifetime. And it was Rock Hudson's illness and death due to AIDS in 1985 that helped begin Taylor's efforts to raise funds and awareness about the disease. Although Hudson's death came years later, Taylor lost another friend and co-star more quickly. It was James Dean. His serious approach to acting and intensity on the set may have contributed more to Taylor's performance in Giant than anyone else. Dean was killed in an automobile crash just as the filming of Giant was finishing. This would not be the last time sudden death would visit Taylor. In 1956, Taylor began filming Rain Tree County, based on the 1948 bestseller about Indiana during the Civil War. The studio looked upon the project as a potential new Gone with the Wind. During the early stages of filming, Taylor's co-star Montgomery Cliff suffered a near-fatal auto accident. Production had to be halted while Cliff underwent extensive facial plastic surgery. It was during this period that Elizabeth Taylor fell in love with Mike Todd. Todd was 50 years old, married twice, and bankrupt twice. He was a gruff and flamboyant theatrical producer who had just finished production of his first film, an all-star, multi-million dollar adaptation of Around the World in 80 Days. Ironically, Taylor was one of the few Hollywood stars not in the film. Todd had bigger plans for Taylor. But first, Taylor had to complete filming The Interrupted Rain Tree County. One day, Michael Todd approached Taylor with a very unusual proposition. It was during the period that Mike was producing 80 Days that I became part of his life. I'd seen Mike at several parties and knew him. It was fun being with him. I was attracted to him, but not overly. The day after my separation from Michael Wilding, Mike called me and said he had to see me right away. He just told me. I mean, that was all it was to it. He said I was to meet him at MGM at 2.30 and to meet him outside the administration building. So I waited. It was 10 minutes late, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. I said, oh. And I didn't really want to leave, so I went into the administration building and I left a message that I would be in one of the vice president's offices, Benny Thor. So I went upstairs and I was sitting in his office and I had my feet on the table and was sipping a Coke. And Mike charged in, I mean, rather like a bull. He just charged in without saying a word to anyone. And he came over to the table and he grabbed me by the arm, still without saying a word, just dragged me out of the office, down the corridor, shoved me in a, into an elevator, still not speaking, marching me along another corridor, breaking my arm. We went into a deserted office. He sort of plunked me down on a couch, pulled a chair around, started in on a spiel that lasted about an hour and a half with a, without a stop, saying that he loved me and that there was no question about it, but we were going to be married. Well, I just sort of looked at him and... Well, I guess rather the way a rabbit looks at a mongoose. I was absolutely sort of hypnotized. All kinds of thoughts were going through my mind. I thought, well, he's, he's out of his mind. He's, he's, he's stark raving mad. Barely divorced from Michael Wilding, Elizabeth Taylor and Mike Todd were married on February the 2nd, 1957, in Acapulco, Mexico. Best man at the wedding was Michael Todd's friend, Eddie Fisher. Todd presented Taylor with diamonds worth a quarter of a million dollars, and two movie theaters in Chicago renamed his and Liz. When Mike bought me my engagement ring, I think he was almost as proud of it as I was, but he always used to make a joke about it, saying that it was uh, 29 and 7 eighths carats because 30 would have been vulgar. <laughs> I call it my ice skating ring. One month later, Mike Todd, a man who had never made a movie before, accepted the Best Picture Oscar for Around the World in 80 Days. And somewhat obscured by the barrage of publicity concerning Todd and Taylor's romance and marriage was the fact that Elizabeth Taylor had been nominated for her first Academy Award for Raintree County. 
The newlyweds began a global trip to promote around the world in 80 days. The press and crowds followed their every move. Todd seemed determined to buy half of Europe for Elizabeth, and each purchase was duly noted by the ever-present reporters. Ever the showman, Todd used all the publicity his outrageous spending and glamorous wife could muster to promote his movie. And the announcement that the Todds were expecting a child only added more interest in the couple. But all the public attention had a downside. Both the mercurial Todd and the hot-blooded Taylor occasionally got into some very public spats. Taylor once said, it's part of the way we make love. Thank Todd, welcome home. How was the trip? Oh, it was lovely, thank you very much. When are you expecting the baby? Uh, well, I'm not uh, actually quite sure. I haven't been to see the doctor yet. Oh, I'm going this afternoon. But uh, sometime around October, I think. Frank, there's been a lot of publicity uh, about your public spats. Uh, I even what? something something about Bite a... Your uh, tongue. About a champagne bottle incident. Uh, please tell well, me about it. That is the most filthy thing I've ever heard in my life. I usually don't get cross. But the person that wrote this story is a frustrated old biddy who takes her frustrations out on her typewriter. And to me, it is such a sad commentary. And if anybody believes it, uh, that's even sadder. I wish everybody could be as um, unhappy as we are. Then there'd be no wars, there'd be no problems. The world would be quite nice. Would you suggest a good fight now and then to uh, married couples, Mike? Well, we're not introverts. We, if we have something to say, I say, hey, Liz. She always, hey, Mike. And I, if, if you make a Dreyfus case out of that, then it's too bad. But we're very, uh, well, I, I, we're, we're so happy. It doesn't uh, matter. I don't really don't care like what anybody even... thinks anyway, because we know. And we'll know well, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, if we're still alive. This babe, babe incidentally, pardon me. This babe, incidentally, said uh, six months or something, you know? She's been in Hollywood too long. Yeah. Well, Liz, uh, I'm quoting you now. You once said uh, you had the mind of a child in a woman's body. Am I right? That was when I was 15, yes. Sir. Oh, I see. Well, I was wondering, since you've been married to such a mat mature man of the world as Mr. Todd, you feel you've matured somewhat now? Well, I hope so. Otherwise, I'd be slightly retarded, wouldn't I? <laughs> well, thanks very much, uh, Mike and Liz, and best of luck with the baby. You see, you're not playing with children. That was a pretty good comeback. Yes, that was pretty yes. good. That was for me, not for your camera. <laughs> On August 6, 1957, Taylor gave birth prematurely to her third child, Elizabeth Frances Liza Todd. Later that year, Mike Todd decided to throw a party for Around the World in 80 Days, which had grossed over $17 million in its first year of release. Todd rented New York's Madison Square Garden and invited 17,000 of his best friends. He also talked CBS into paying a quarter of a million dollars for the television rights. It turned out to be a mighty spectacle, but not the kind Todd had planned. Waiters sold the free champagne for $10 a bottle. The elegantly dressed guests scrambled to grab the food, while looters and freeloaders made off with prizes and gifts. Mike and Liz stayed long enough for Liz to cut the birthday cake, and then the couple fled the scene. The event is considered today one of the great show business fiascos of all time, but it did keep the money rolling in for Around the World in 80 Days. Elizabeth Taylor's next film project would be Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, the role of Maggie the Cat probably would have gone to Grace Kelly, but she had left for Monaco. Mike Todd realized the studio really needed Taylor and renegotiated a lucrative new contract with MGM. The team of Taylor and Todd was formidable indeed. Elizabeth seemed to be happy at last. Home life was so fulfilling for Taylor, there was even talk of her quitting films. She said, being married to Mike has given me a chance to be with my children. I love it. On March 22nd, 1958, Mike Todd flew to New York in his private plane, the Liz, to be honored as showman of the year. Elizabeth wanted to accompany him, but she had a virus. At 2.30 a.m., the plane flew over the mountains of New Mexico and was never heard from again. When the wreckage was found, the only thing left that could identify Todd was his gold wedding ring. When Taylor was told the news that Todd was dead, she kept repeating, it just can't be, it just can't be. Friends and relatives rushed to Taylor's side, including Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds. Mike Todd's funeral was held in Chicago on March 25, 1958. After a brief period of seclusion and deep depression, Taylor resumed filming Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in April of 1958. Todd's death and Taylor's emotional state at the time may account for her effectiveness in the role of Maggie. Paul Newman, her co-star, said she was astonishing. Taylor won her second Academy Award nomination for Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. The most exciting star of our time Maggie the cat is alive! I'm alive! In Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, she's Maggie the cat. A woman who turned her bed into a cage. But I can't 
can't live on this way. Now you agreed to accept that condition. I know I did, but I can't. Maggie! Cat on a hot tin roof, based on Tennessee Williams' bold, explosive, Pulitzer Prize-winning play. You and Skipper and millions like you living in a kid's world. Playing games, touchdowns, no worries, no responsibilities. Maggie, the woman who kissed, clawed, and caressed her way back to the man she had to own. Elizabeth Taylor, Paul Newman, Burl Ives, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Less than one month after Mike Todd's death, the fan magazines trumpeted Taylor's shocking new affair with none other than Eddie Fisher. The trouble started as soon as the couple were seen in public. Fisher had been best man at Taylor's wedding, and he was Mike Todd's closest friend. And the Todds and the Fishers were frequently seen together during Mike's life. But Eddie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds were also America's sweethearts. What first must have started as Fisher's innocent attempt to console a widow now looked like full-scale homewrecking on Elizabeth Taylor's part. The nation was shocked and also riveted to their every move. In an interview with Hedda Hopper, Taylor was asked what Mike Todd would have thought about the Fisher affair. Her answer made worldwide headlines the next day. Mike's dead, I'm alive. What do you expect me to do, sleep alone? On May 12, 1959, Elizabeth Taylor married Eddie Fisher in a Jewish ceremony in Las Vegas. From that moment on, the public would never look at Elizabeth Taylor the same way. Immediately after the wedding, Taylor flew to London to begin filming Suddenly Last Summer. The film's shocking subject matter of cannibalism, homosexuality, and insanity seemed a poor choice for Taylor, but it did reunite her with Montgomery Cliff. Her instincts proved right, and Taylor, along with co-star Katharine Hepburn, were nominated for Academy Awards. This generation's greatest author and poet, writer of a streetcar named Desire and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, unashamedly writes of a woman's strong wants and a man's strange needs. Six great stars combine their talents to recreate Suddenly Last Summer, Tennessee Williams' magnificent drama. Something horrible happened to that girl last summer. Some dreadful traumatic experience of some kind. What? It was a one-piece bathing suit made of something white. The water made it transparent. I, I told him I didn't want to swim in it, but he... He just grabbed me by the hand and dragged me into the water all the way in. I came out looking nude. Why did he do that? Do you know why he did that? Yes. You know why I was doing it. I told you. In September 1959, Taylor agreed to appear in 20th Century Fox mega production of Cleopatra for the unheard of fee of $1 million. MGM insisted she film Butterfield 8 first, which would finally end her long-term contract with the studio. Under great duress, she arrived in New York to begin filming. She hated the script and demanded many rewrites. She told the press, making this film gripes the hell out of me. You have a price. We all have, and I can go pretty high. Command performances leave me quite cold. I've had more fun in the back seat of a 39 Ford than I could ever have in the vault of the Chase National Bank. You're all alike, aren't you? Play tough. I'm not like anyone, I'm me. She's not like anyone, that's for sure. Only the bold and candid pen of John O'Hara can tell her story. Only Elizabeth Taylor can live it surpassing even Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and suddenly last summer in a portrayal that enhances her stature as one of the screen's great dramatic actresses. We both know what I've been doing. No, I don't want to hear that. Mama, you have to. Oh, face it, Mama. I was the sl... <gasps> if 
only you've done that before. Long ago, every time I came home, all soaked through with gin. Gloria. Huh? Sure. Oh, she's, she's frantic, isn't she? Well, welcome to the fraternity. We meet once a year in Yankee Stadium. Lawrence Harvey is Liggett, his most dramatic starring role since Room at the Top. You act like a man who's expecting his wife back in town. Look, Gloria, I, I have to spend at least a night with her. A good night's sleep will be the best thing for you. Eddie Fisher gives a surprise performance as Steve, the one trusted friend who would speak the truth. Because I'm sick of opening that door every other day and finding you boozed up, burned out, and ugly. Why do you come here like this? Where have I always come, Steve? At least I can be honest with you. Dina Merrill plays Emily Liggett, the frustrated wife who had to face the challenging reality of Gloria. Do you love her? That woman you were with? I seem to. But you fought over her and sent her away in a rage. And I hated her unreasonably because I couldn't stand the thought of losing her. May I say something to you? Sure. Say something sexy. Something that always got the boys headed straight for the motel. No. You're a joke. A dirty joke from one end of this town to the other. In September of 1960, Taylor traveled to England to begin Cleopatra. From the onset, the film seemed ill-fated. It suffered from production delays and incredible cost overruns. To add to its problems, Taylor contracted an infection and was forced to return to Hollywood, effectively closing down production. Recovered, Taylor rejoined the Cleopatra cast in Rome, but on March 4, 1961, she was again taken ill, this time with pneumonia, and rushed to London for treatment. It was very serious, and medical reports revealed she nearly died. One month later, Elizabeth Taylor won her first Academy Award for Butterfield 8, the film she didn't want to make. Later, she confessed to reporters, the reason I got the Oscar was because I had come within a breath of dying. I knew it was a sympathy award, but I was proud to get it. On September 1st, 1961, Elizabeth Taylor, Oscar in hand, and husband Eddie Fisher in tow, arrived in Rome to once again begin filming Cleopatra, or as Taylor was quoted, to be the first Jewish queen of Egypt. Taylor, having taken up the Jewish faith before marrying Eddie Fisher. The role of Mark Anthony was now played by Richard Burton, who had replaced Stephen Boyd during the production delays. Burton was coming off a smash Broadway engagement as King Arthur in Camelot. What followed has become one of the most notorious and publicized affairs in the 20th century. Taylor and Burton quickly fell in love. Before the eyes of the entire world and eager reporters, Taylor and Burton conducted an open love affair. Burton completely underestimated the public's total fascination with Taylor's love affairs and later said, I really didn't do it on purpose. How was I to know she was the most famous woman in the world? Eddie Fisher, shaken and publicly embarrassed, promptly filed for divorce, demanding half of Taylor's Cleopatra salary. The film and the affair had taken on global proportions. The Vatican stated, Taylor was an intemperate vamp who destroys families and devours husbands. 20th Century Fox reportedly had sunk over $40 million in the production of Cleopatra, and now it seemed the only way they could hope to get their money back was to use the publicity surrounding Taylor and Burton. As the mammoth production rolled slowly on, Taylor announced she would divorce Fisher as soon as she returned to the United States. But Richard Burton was unsure of what his next move would be, and he announced he would be returning to his wife, Sybil Burton. Upon hearing Burton's announcement, Taylor checked into a hospital with rumors of stomach pumping being performed. After the completion of filming of Cleopatra in the summer of 1962, both Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton traveled to Switzerland where they stayed in separate homes. But in July, the couple was seen together in Geneva. Post-production for Cleopatra would take a year. Meanwhile, Taylor and Burton were the hottest team in films. Quickly, Metro contracted them to appear in the VIPs, with Taylor playing none other than an adulterous wife in the film. The VIPs became the first of the legendary Burton-Taylor films. I think you may have. 
have a gun. You're not going through that gate, Francis. I'm not going to let you go through that gate. I kill you first. These are VIPs, a famous international beauty, her millionaire husband, and her boyfriend, trapped by a grounded jet flight. I very much regret that the takeoff is no longer possible, and our orders are to disembark you. Isn't there any place we can hide in this damn airport? No, Mark. We're not hiding away or sneaking anywhere. We've done enough of that in the past three months. Elizabeth Taylor, as the darling of London society, has one of the finest dramatic roles of her career. No need to see me off. But I want to. Make sure I've gone. Richard Burton is Paul Andrews, the millionaire who has everything. Everything except his wife's love. Which tender emotion is now in the keeping of a charming philanderer, played by Louis Jordan? How am I going to fix adjoining rooms for us without seeming too obvious? Your past experience should help you there, shouldn't it? She'll look after you and take you up to our special VIP lounge. How do you do, sir? VIPs, very important persons. The famous and the near famous. Each one confronted with a crisis brought about by the delayed flights. I've got to get out of this country. Midnight tonight. The movie producer. Uh, an unusual role for Orson Welles. Midnight. Or I lose one million dollars. And his Italian movie star, played by Elsa Martinelli. I'm going to be in Mr. Buddha's next picture. Mary Stewart. Is a tragedy. Is a tragedy, eh, darling? Is a tragedy. I wanted to be treated as a wife, not an expensive mistress. The eagerly awaited premiere of Cleopatra happened in New York in June 1964. Of the film, Taylor said, it must be the most eccentric film ever made. It cut out the heart, the essence. I found it vulgar. The critics were equally unkind, calling it overweight, overpaid, and underacted. Unlike Cleopatra, the VIPs quickly became a multi-million dollar hit. On March 15, 1964, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton were married in Canada where Burton was rehearsing his stage version of Hamlet. During the summer of 1964, Taylor accompanied Richard Burton to New York for his performance of the play, and huge crowds followed the couple's every move, especially when they left for Europe after the play ended its Broadway run. Mr. Taylor, would you repeat that comment about the crowds, how you feel about them? <laughs> Mr. Burton, I'm sorry. You better be. Yes, I'm very sorry. Mr. Are you looking forward to visiting your native land? Yes, I am. I always love to go back to England. Would you do another Cleopatra, Miss Taylor? No, I wouldn't. Why not? We've got a, we've got a rough for the lousy uh, film. Uh, how do you feel about the American election? Who would you favor, Mr. Johnson or Mr. Goldwater? Well, obviously, Mr. Johnson. Why, sir? Uh, I like the way he looks. And how about Mr. Goldwater? He looks pretty good, doesn't he? Not as photogenic as Mr. Johnson. And what about the British election, sir? What? What about the British election? I don't care who gets in. They're both equally nebulous. I never knew a man could be so strong. In 1965, both Taylor and Burton were paid a million dollars each to appear in the MGM release, The Sandpiper. The New York Herald said, If I were you, I wouldn't settle for less for watching them. Despite bad reviews, public interest in the couple was so strong that the film broke Radio City's first weekend records and grossed over $7 million domestically. But nothing could keep them apart. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, the Sandpiper. Making money seemed easy for the Burtons, but making the critics take notice of their validity as a great screen team was harder. But the 1966 Warner release of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf changed all that. The film was based on the 1962 Edward Albee play. One review said, 
Miss Taylor's portrayal of the vulgar, domineering wife is easily the finest performance of her career. George Siegel, Sandy Dennis, are the newcomers led by their charming host and hostess to the hell that hides behind those ivy-clad university walls. Edward Albee wrote the play, the most acclaimed work by this controversial author. Ernest Lehman wrote the screenplay. He did the same for West Side Story and Sound of Music. Mike Nichols directs. His unbroken series of theatrical triumphs have given him a position without peer or rival. All you have to say is Elizabeth Taylor. Richard Burton's reviews were equally as good. The film received five Oscar nominations, with both Taylor and Burton getting Best Acting nominations. Elizabeth Taylor won her second Best Actress Award for her work in the film, and it became her favorite role. Capitalizing on the success of Virginia Woolf, Burton and Taylor next appeared in the 1967 production of The Taming of the Shrew. Director Franco Zeffirelli originally wanted the roles to be played by Marcello Mastriani and Sophie Loren. But after seeing Taylor and Burton fight their way through Virginia Woolf, he decided to go with them instead of his first choice. One review said of Taylor, she held nothing back in attacking the role with blazing fury. She is magnificent. <laughs> Thou must be married to no man but me. For I am he and born to tame you, Kate. I'd rather die! If you haven't tamed any good shrews lately, she's just what you've been waiting for. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. Elizabeth, did you enjoy playing Shakespeare? Well, I was absolutely terrified in the beginning. First of all, I'm... Uh... My accent is essentially American, even though I'm British. And I've never done Shakespeare before. And the whole idea of acting with all the marvelous Shakespearean actors, all the great character players, including my husband, who's a marvelous character actor. I certainly am. <laughs> I was really terrified. And I was so scared that the first day of shooting, at my own request, and Everybody agreed, but they were terribly sweet about it. I could see the expressions on their faces. I mean, it just wouldn't do, because I was paralyzed. I couldn't get a word out. But nobody else thought that. I may say the other actors, the brilliant actors like Michael Horton and uh, Cyril Cusack and Victor Spinetti and so on, thought that Elizabeth was perfectly all right the first day, but she insisted on reshooting it anyway. In order to show you that we are not averse to first nights, and particularly the first night of The Taming of the Shrew, which is very near to us because it happens to be our first production and we would like to show you some scenes where we i hope show some sort of nervous excitement about attending the royal film performance in london the setting for the most spectacular entertainment event of the year the world premiere of elizabeth taylor and richard burton's new motion picture the taming of the shrew the arrival of the burtons has a special excitement all its own crowds have waited for hours in the rain for this moment the screen's most celebrated acting couple join the great and the famous who have come from three continents for the widely heralded opening. Presentation of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton to Princess Margaret. Cameras of the international press record the meeting. It all adds up to a truly royal send-off for the screen's reigning king and queen and their latest motion picture, The Taming of the Shrew. Just when it seemed that Taylor and Burton had settled into a niche as the screen's foremost couple, not only for their acting talent, but for their ability to select good projects, along came the 1967 release, Dr. Faustus. By any standards, it was an immense failure. One review said, lots of grads bring their wives back to the old school to ham it up for the home movies. But this is ridiculous. Richard Burton is charging admission. <laughs> 